My name is Sandra Peter and I'm the director of Sydney Business Insights at the University of Sydney Business School. Before we begin our event, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of Australia and recognize their continuing connection to land, water and culture. I am currently on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional owners of the land on which the University of Sydney is built. I acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional owners. As we share our knowledge, teaching, learning and research practices within this university, may we also pay respects to the knowledge embedded forever within the Aboriginal custodianship of country. My name is Dan Lavallo. I'm a professor at the University of Sydney Business School. And I have the great pleasure in inviting to uh, a webinar today uh, a friend of mine for uh, well, 30 years, although it's, uh, it's a little hard to believe it from looking at us. Uh, and I'm in, uh, delighted to introduce my friend Richard Thaler. I could go through a long list of his accomplishments, but really when you say Nobel Prize, do you need to keep you know, I'll, I'll add a few things. So he's won the Nobel Prize in Economics. He um, He's also the, the star of numerous films, um, and including The Big Short. And I think his biggest accomplishment in some sense, and we're going to talk today about his new book, uh, Nudge, the Final Edition, I Lost Out. I, I well, I wasn't an author, but I argue for Nudge the Final Frontier, which is written with Cass Sunstein. His previous book, Nudge, uh, has led to over 400 behavioral science groups around the world. So that's a pretty darn practical, pretty darn good practical contribution. He also, as you'll see throughout this, is uh, incredibly creative for, well, I don't even want to say for an economist. He's incredibly creative period, and um, he, he puts the lie to the fact that you have to be, if you're a genius, somehow that's correlated with being a jerk, because that's the last thing Richard is, a jerk. He's very generous with his time. He's come to see us this year, and he came to see, if you're lucky enough to go to the University of Sydney and had taken negotiation classes last year, he came to see us last year as well, so uh, we, we'd like to consider him a friend of the family, although he's perfectly happy as not being in the family, uh, just sort of a friend of the family, as I think, uh, as far as we want to go. Um, and the way I met him was interesting, and I think it's a way around that time a lot of behavioral economists were meeting people was uh, we were both at Cornell, and I kept raising my hand and, and saying, uh, I'm sorry, people don't behave that way. I didn't realize I was joining an, an applied math course. I thought I was doing economics, uh, but in your first two years of economics, they are one and the same. And so after I'd done this a number of times, the professor, um, one could say maybe to nurture me or quite possibly to get rid of me said, there's this gentleman, Richard Thaler, over at the business school. Why don't you go see him? And it kind of implied was never come back again, but he didn't say that. And then um, I went and saw Richard and got incredibly excited about his research. Unfortunately, halfway through the year, he told me, you know, he told me. Now, I don't know if this is true or not. He told me, I'm thinking about going to Berkeley, so why don't you imply there just in case? Now I applied there, I waited up, you know, Berkeley winters, uh, Ithaca winters, um, and then I ended up going, uh, I ended up going to Berkeley and meeting his good friend, Daniel Kahneman. Now, Daniel is not uh, particularly, Danny, I, I think we can say that word, is not particularly effusive in his generosity, but by far the biggest compliment he ever gave me was um, that I was a poor man, Richard Thaler. He meant it as a compliment. I took it as a compliment. And, you know, in lots of ways, it turns out to be true. So Richard, thank you so much uh, for coming and joining us today.
I hope I haven't gotten over my time limit, uh, but I will now hand this back to Dr. Sandra Peter, who is the director of Sydney Business Insights at the Business School, and she will later be joined by Professor Mark Steers, director of the Sydney Public Policy Lab. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan, and welcome, Richard. I do wish we were doing this in person, uh, but welcome online and welcome to our audience from over 40 countries. And before we get to the, to the questions, I want to remind everyone watching that you can still submit questions on slido.com using the event code SBI. And thank you for the many, many questions you have already submitted. Before we move to audience question, questions, I would like to start the conversation, Richard, by asking you about the basics. So let me start with what is nudging. A nudge is any small feature of the environment that attracts our attention and uh, alters our behavior. And uh, it does so without requiring anyone to do anything and without economic incentives. So the rational economic actors and economic models would not be affected by nudges, but humans are. Can you give us a couple of examples? Sure. You know, we all use nudges all the time in our daily life. We set an alarm to wake us up in the morning. We don't have to set an alarm. We don't have to get up. It's just a nudge. Uh, we have a calendar invite to remind us that we have a webinar at seven o'clock my time. Um, we put money aside uh, into an account that we label retirement money. All of these are nudges that we do to ourselves and uh, other people are nudging us all the time for good or for bad. Can you clarify a bit the difference between a um, nudge and how it's different to a shove or a push? Sure. Uh, we define a nudge as something you can opt out of almost costlessly. Ideally, one click. So... Pushes and shoves are harder to evade. So somebody is pushing you, you know, you have to lean in to avoid being pushed. Our ideal, our, our ideal of nudging is uh, GPS. Both of us, Cass and I, have terrible sense of direction. And we get lost all the time, or we used to. And now, you know, you turn on Google Maps and you decide where you want to go and it makes a suggestion if you see something else you want to go to never complains it's perfect so our ideal life would be one in which everything you have to do in life is as easy as following the gps directions from home to work nudging is kind of closely related to, idea, to the idea of, of choice architecture. And choice architecture is kind of a set of ideas you brought over from design, from human design literature. How, how should we think about choice architecture? Choice architecture is just the environment in which we choose. So uh, think about the Amazon storefront, which of course is just a web page. Now, they have essentially every book in print anywhere and some that are out of print. If you went into a physical store that had that, you would run away. It, it would just be horrible. And you could certainly never find anything. How would they have it organized? Now a small bookstore, you know, can be fiction, nonfiction, a whole section devoted to nudge, presumably. Um, but the, the reason why Amazon or Netflix um, can operate on the scale they do is they have good choice architecture, meaning people can find what they want. And w we encounter choice architecture everywhere. If we go to a restaurant, someone has decided 
what food will be cooked. Someone else has decided how to write that down in a menu, how to group things, how to order things. And to a first approximation, everything matters. So choice architecture and nudging are in some way inevitable, everything. Yeah, there are, you know, some of our critics have said over the years, well, you shouldn't be nudging. That's none of your business. Um, and they are living in a world that doesn't exist. It's a world in which there's a neutral way to do things. And there, it, there is no, imagine a bookstore. Uh, they have to arrange the books on shelves. They have to do it somehow. And random wouldn't be a good way. So there are lots of different ways to do it. And they nudge you to buy some books by putting them in piles in the front. That's nudging. And, uh, but there's no neutral way to do it. So even, even active choice is in some ways a choice architecture. Absolutely. And, you know, we don't always want active choice. So, you know, how many times do you say uh, to your partner uh, or your partner says, what do you want to watch tonight? You say, I don't care. You pick. Right? Uh, and you can get into a fight. No, you pick. No, you pick. So th there are times where we just want somebody to pick. And some of the best restaurants in the world that I've ever been to have no choice. You go in. You know, the best way to eat at a Japanese restaurant is omakase. That means the chef let, picks. Let the chef you, pick for you. You, you eat. <laughs> Nothing's better than that. You can tell them if you're allergic to something. But that's, um, anyway. Yeah, we can't get around choice architecture any more than we can have a neutral architecture. If you design a building, it has to have doors. It has to have stairs and elevators and bathrooms and where you situate those things will affect how the building works. What's the most important principle of choice architecture? Well, I think it's to make it easy for people to achieve their goals. Dan in his introduction mentioned that governments around the world have created so-called nudge units. I was involved in the first one that David Cameron formed in, in Britain in 2010. <clears throat> and I would go around on some of the early meetings and it became my mantra and the group's mantra. If you want people to do something, make it easy. So, you know, the GPS wants me to follow the map make it as obvious as possible which way it wants me to go. And that's the most important principle in, in any aspect of life, business or government. We'll come back to making it um, too easy a little bit later <laughs> on. But um, before that, I, I, I want to take you a bit to this idea of, of kind of unlearning homo economicus. So I want to reflect for, for a second on just how big a departure the premise of what we've just talked about, nudge and, and choice architecture and behavioral economics is from, from mainstream economic theory. And the core premise of economics is that people choose by, by optimizing and that people are rational and respond to incentive. And this model has, has dominated uh, economics and has an incredible influence still. And for the last four, four decades, um, you've, your work has shown how people depart from these fictional creatures in, in economic models. And you've, co you've coined econs and humans in, in the first uh, in the first nudged book, but it goes back to observations you've, you've made in, in, in grad school. Can you tell us a bit about that? Sure. So, you know, much like Dan was describing his experience in graduate school, I kept saying, where are these people? So as you put it, well, economic theory is based on a theory of optimization that 
agents. They're not called people. It's amusing that um, people are missing from economic theory and even the word doesn't appear. You talk, they talk about agents and agents can be consumers, they could be producers, they could be, the people are factors of production. Does that sound like humans? So these agents solve. You give them a problem, find the best job because you've been laid off, they solve. So they pick the best one, choose the best mortgage. They look at all the mortgages that they qualify for, they pick the best one. And calculating all the things that could possibly happen to them over the course of the mortgage. This is preposterous. I don't know any economist who can do that. So why does that exist? It's because economists are not that smart. And I don't mean that as an insult. The easiest problems to write down formally are ones that you write down max. Because anybody who's had high school calculus knows how to solve, find the maximum of some function. You take a derivative, set it equal to zero, check the second order conditions, right? If describing behavior of wandering through the supermarket, picking the things that you vaguely remember you were supposed to be there to buy and not paying any attention to things on sale or things that look good or ice cream, yum. Uh, That's hard to model. And uh, so economists took the easy way out. It wasn't always that way. Adam Smith, people think of Adam Smith as Mr. Laissez-faire, leave everything alone. Um, But he talked about very modern concepts like overconfidence and loss aversion. It's all in Adam Smith. I just rediscovered it. Now, I must say, though, economists... um never have to start a book then by explaining homo economicus, yet it's quite obvious that people suffer from, you know, the problems you've just described, self-control, chocolate, and all the kinds of emotions that that affect their behavior. Um, Humans still have to be the first chapter in in every one of your books and in every behavioral economics book. Um, And for all the the, the tremendous success that Notch has, has had, homo economicus is still the dominant species. And then your work building on, on obviously on Kahneman and, and Tversky's work um, was first a nuisance, then, then it came to be kind of tolerated, if not outright accepted. Um, what's been your experience over the years trying to change people's minds? Why is it so hard to change economists and policy pe- policymakers' minds? Yeah, you know, I, I often say I don't think I changed anyone's mind. I've been at this for 40 years. I'm not aware of any economist who changed their mind about this stuff. So how have I and my colleagues succeeded? The strategy was corrupt the youth. Now, some like Dan didn't need that much corrupting, but we, I said, look, it's not going to work to try and convince Gary Becker or Bob Lucas or Gene Fama, uh, my Chicago colleagues who are famous adherents to the rational model, I'm gonna try to get graduate students interested in this. And Danny Kahneman and I, uh, with another colleague of ours, Colin Kammerer, started a tradition in 1994 of having a summer camp, two two weeks for the best graduate students from around the world. And most of the great behavioral economists working today are graduates of that summer camp. And it's now being taught and has been taught for a decade or more by two people who were at the first one as students, David Labson and Matthew Rabin. How do we get ordinary people to change their minds? I mean, I, I, take, I take your point about, about economists, you know, it's really difficult to change their mind on something they've worked on their entire lives. 
But how, how do we collectively kind of unlearn homo economicus as the exception oh, than the rule? I, I, I think the rest of the world finds homo economicus just to be rather amusing. And now it's true that economists have undue weight. I said once that in the U.S., the government is run by lawyers who occasionally listen to economists. And I don't know how it is down under, but uh, economists have a lot of influence and pretty much run things like the central bank. Um, and there's a council of economic advisors. There's no council of psychological advisors and, or anything, any other kind of advisors. There's not even a council of scientific advisors. There is an office that's more or less that. But uh, economists have great sway and uh, they have traditionally adhered to the standard model, but that's, that's changing. And um, certainly the economists in the Obama administration and in the Biden administration were, if not flag-carrying behavioral economists, they were uh, certainly friendly converts. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, a quick reminder, I, I keep glancing to my, to my other screen, is just to check on our questions from Slido. A quick reminder that you can still submit questions using the event code um, SBI, and also lots of comments on your Australian bottle of wine. Um, back there, so well, well chosen. <laughs> well chosen. Uh, it's, it was just a bottle I pu pulled out at random. Um, I wish we were doing this in person again. <laughs> <laughs> I'll come uh, to Sydney someday if you if you let me in. As, as soon as they <laughs> open, um, I'll come to have you. You've launched <laughs> your, your first book with us. That um, would be lovely to 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 host you again. Um, let me come to, to, to why we're here, to the final, final edition. So the first nudge was, was published back in early 2008, and a lot's happened around that time. In 2007, was, it the, was a big year. The first iPhone, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube all came about in 2007, um, not just tech, social media um, came then. Since then, we've had COVID-19. Unfortunately, climate change is still a thing all these years later. It does seem like the right time to come up with the, with the new edition. I've got my, my, my copy up here. And I see you've got the nice one with the elephants, uh, elephants back there. Yeah, it by the way, I loved that gif uh, of the origami elephants. I thank you for that uh, <laughs> in, in that's the introduction. That's our, that's our graphic designer, Nico, and we'll make sure you, you get a copy for use oh, in yeah, um, your own, your own uh, event. I will use it with credit. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Um, we'll, we'll come to COVID and, and climate in, in a minute. I know Mark's, Mark's getting ready for, with, with his questions, but let's, let's talk sludge first. It seems to go uh, against the most important principle. You, you mentioned easier, you know, making it easy. <laughs> Tell me a bit about sludge. Yeah, so sludge is sort of evil nudging or inept nudging. Uh, let me give you an innocent example. Uh, you nudged me earlier today by sending me an email that included the link to this event tonight, which was just as well because searching for it, I would have had to remember to look for an email from no reply hyphen Zoom. Now, you know how many of those are in my email box? Quite a, a few, I suspect. Yeah. So who thought of that? That you would send that important email from that anonymous account? That's sludge. It's not evil. Not, Zoom is in the business of making this sort of event bearable. And we've all, we've all grown to hate it, but thankfully it existed in 2020 because I don't know what we would have done without it. So, but there's lots of intentional sludge. 
The thing that got me started on sludge was when my previous book, Misbehaving, came out in 2015, there was a very nice review published in the Times of London, but they have one of the strictest paywalls in the business. None of this 10 free articles. You can't look at the first word of an article, but they have a trial subscription for one pound a mere pound and a 30 day, a one month trial subscription. So I'm thinking, hmm, I'm, I'm curious about what they think of the book, but the trial subscription, I better check how you get out of this. So I look at the fine print and I see, in order to unsubscribe, which you better do because they will automatically resubscribe you, you have to give a credit card for that one pound. There's no way to put the bill in, right? So you, uh, what do you have to do? You have to call London during London business hours, not on a toll-free line. Now imagine doing this from Sydney. There's probably, there's about, we found there were about two hours when we're both awake to do this event. And uh, there was about two hours, I would have had two hours while I was awake and they were awake to cancel this. Now, amusingly, the Times just published a very nice review of the final edition. Congratulations. And I um, pointed out to the author the origin that the Times deserves credit for the term sludge and I dared him to put that into his article, which he did. <laughs> now, go read it, but uh, it helps if you have one of those burner credit cards that are one use only, because otherwise you better remember to unsubscribe. I don't think the university provides, but... <laughs> <laughs> Um, let me let me follow that up with the question that's been asked a couple of times um, a couple of times in in the audience because there have been many um, nudges um, implemented by governments and and by many employers that have a very sludgy flavor. How how do we reduce sludge in organization, especially when it comes to to really important things? Well, you know, I think um, in the private sector, one of the biggest sludge emitters is the Department of Human Resources. And I, it's not completely their fault. I mean, they, they sort of are the part of the organization that makes sure that all the rules are being followed. But, you know, even, so here's an amusing and fairly harmless bit of sludge. I have a university credit card um, and I bought something on Amazon uh, and then for, for my something from my office, didn't like it and sent it back. And by the time the report came in, the charge had already been refunded, but I still had to provide a receipt for the zero balance so that they could scratch it off. Why they needed to know what it was that I didn't spend any of the university's money on is a mystery to me. So there, there's no organization that couldn't save lots of money and make their employees all a lot happier by just going through and getting rid of sludge. And uh, I must say, I haven't been successful at eliminating it at my university, although they're, they're pretty good about these things. As, as they are at the University of Sydney. Um, <laughs> quite a few questions um, and very popular questions on, on COVID on um, Slido. So we'll, 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 move it, we'll move it to policy questions. And I'm going to hand over now to my colleague, Mark. Um, Professor Mark Steers is the director of the Sydney Policy Lab, and Mark's going to um, turn 
to COVID uh, and, and later on climate, but I do want to remind you to keep uh, posting your questions. Uh, Mark, over to you. Thanks, Sandra. Thank you so much, Sandra. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be in conversation. Richard, thank you so much for joining us. And as Sandra said, we're all eyeing that bottle of wine very enviously here. <laughs> um, we've been inundated with questions um, from people on the two major policy issues of the moment here in Australia, which are obviously COVID and climate change. So I wanted just to start with COVID and, uh, and really just wondering about what you think has been different about government's response across the world to the pandemic uh, because of Nudge uh, that might have been the case had Nudge not been written. So what have we seen in terms of intelligent uses of Nudge insights uh, across the world? Um, or perhaps you've been frustrated and you think that uh, people should have picked up the book more eagerly uh, and learned more effectively from what you've been writing over the last couple of decades. Well, I, I think that there was certainly a lot of nudging going on and not just by the government. Uh, think about uh, just in, in the private sector, if you would go out to a shop, um, smaller shops were, there were rules about how many people could be inside at one time, but most shop owners took a very bit of simple technology. They would take a piece of blue tape and put it on the ground two meters apart and that you didn't have to have a sign. Everybody knew, okay, that's the nudge to be socially distant. And one thing I think hasn't been commented on is pe behavior led government. So if you look at restaurant reservations and travel reservations, they had plummeted by the middle of March and no government had really done anything at that point. Now, some governments have been more successful than others uh, and, and, but, you know, I think some of that has been wisdom. Some of that has been luck. Uh, we've all been, blessed by the miracle of the vaccines. And certainly Cass and I can't take any credit for that. Um, I think the rollout of the vaccines has varied and at least in the US, in the initial period, there was quite a bit of sludge and there was a sort of a policy choice how much are you going to try to direct who goes first versus get as many shots in arms as fast as possible? And I, I'm not saying I know what the right answer to that is, but there was a lot of sludge and the sludge often acts in a way that benefits the educated and the wealthy because they're just, better at working the system. So I, I spent much of the early part of the pandemic in Berkeley and the neighborhood I was in had lots of educated people and there were emails flying around. Oh, they have shots over here. They have shots over there. Uh, people who were less connected uh, weren't as benefiting from that. So make it easy. You know, my mantra, that was the key to stage one. Even more important in stage two, which was getting the people who weren't clamoring for the shot, make it as easy as possible for them. Often that meant going to where they are, especially in rural areas and having no appointments, you know, eventually you could walk into any drugstore and, and get a shot. That was very important. We're now in the United States getting to the third stage or are well into the third stage where we're dealing with people 
who have very strong opinions that they should not get a vaccine. Uh, I'm not sure what those things are based on, but um, as I've written about recently, I think we are past the point of nudging when it comes to the vaccine. And the, the reason for that is uh, vaccinations, it, this is a simple case of an externality. If you're unvaccinated, you can make me sick. Well, probably not from Sydney, but you, you can make your students and colleagues sick and you, you don't have the right to make me sick. So I don't know what Sydney is doing. The University of Chicago has decided if you wanna come back to school in the fall, you have to be vaccinated if you're a student, you have to be vaccinated if you're a faculty member. That's not a nudge, that's a mandate. Now, as far as I know, no government has taken that step. But we're now seeing mandates of various sorts by employers, by universities, by uh, sporting events and concerts. There was a huge outdoor rock concert in Chicago a few weeks ago called Lollapalooza. You had to be vaccinated if you wanted to attend. And it seems like that was pretty effective in preventing a big spreader event. Absolutely. That was too long of an answer, but- No, no, absolutely fascinating. No, absolutely fascinating. I mean, that balance, here uh, between you know, mandating and nudging uh, is the crucial argument that everybody's having right now on, on vaccine. I mean, it, it's also, it takes me to my other policy area though, because it's also the debate I think on climate, which is to, to what extent can you nudge large scale corporations and governments uh, and individuals to behave differently, to make a meaningful impact on climate change? Or is it more like your sort of final third in the vaccination story, where you think we need to move more swiftly or more effectively to a particular kind of mandate or compulsion? So I mean, what's the balance between nudging and compelling when it comes to meaningful action on climate change? So the, I think there are two points. And one of the, we had many motivations for, for re, re, rewriting I mean, what was a pretty successful book? I mean, our publisher thinks that we're nuts. Uh, they cannot think of any example where any author or authors were stupid enough to have done this. So, but, you know, we understand about opportunity costs and there wasn't that much to do back, back in April, 2020. Uh, so, but climate change was one of the motivations because a point we wanted to make in this book is nudge can help any problem, but it's not the solution to every problem and maybe not the solution to any problem. So we believe that the first step for climate change has to be to get the prices right. So, on that, we agree with every economist. People think that economists don't agree about anything. This is one thing, University of Chicago does a poll every couple of weeks of about 50 economists of various persuasions and 100% say we should either have a carbon tax or cap and trade. And notice this maintains choice. It's not like you can opt out of the tax, but you can decide, all right, it's gonna now cost me three times more to drive my car or to heat and cool my home. How am I gonna react to that? Same with firms. And the key to climate change, I think, is largely going to be at the organizational level. Individuals matter but how we generate power, how, whether we build roads versus transit, what kind of cars we build, how we build them, these are all firm level decisions. 
firms maximize profits first. We can get them to think about other things. But if you set the prices right, then they're going to react. And Elon Musk will have a lot of competition if the price of gasoline goes up by a factor of three. So now there is still room for nudging. You, you, you can make it easier, my mantra, you know, on homeowners with smart thermostats, but they have to be smart. So many so-called smart thermostats have the same IQ as the old VHS video recorder, which most professors I know couldn't master. So, and the smart thermostats we've had uh, are baffling to me, but really smart thermostats that know when you come and go and know your habits and know the price. So if we have time fluctuating utilities and they adjust, we can make life a lot simpler. We can, uh, when I'm out in California, if there's a fire risk, we get a text message. And, and by the way, we may turn your power off. So as one of my friends tweeted, she was preparing for that by eating all the ice cream. But uh, <laughs> that, that's, that's one way. So I think we need to get the prices right, but then we can use all the behavioral science. Now, one objection sometimes people make is that these are small. So telling people how much energy they use compared to their neighbors reduces usage by two, 3%, which is not huge. That's not gonna solve the problem, but every bit helps. Mm -hmm. President Obama used to like to say, better is good. So reducing energy by two or 3%, that's better, that's good. So let's take every little bit that we can through automation and uh, other means like firms, we, we advocate making public emissions by every firm. That in some other environmental issues has proven to be quite successful. And firms will, they don't like being shamed. And uh, I, I think there's a lot we can do, but uh, I, I sound like a University of Chicago economist sometimes when I talk about this, because we got to get the price right first. Got to get the prices right. Fantastic. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Uh, Sandra's been going through other audience questions. I'm going to hand back to her to uh, let her take through the, the final selection. Uh, thank you so much, Mark. And thank you, everybody, for the Tons of questions coming in on Slido. It's been fantastic to see so much um, interest in, in, in Richard's work. So we'll try to, we'll try to get through, through a few of those. Um, quite a few questions coming in around um, the limits of nudging, whether that's, you know, what are you nudging about uh, or whether that, that's cultural uh, limits. We have um, Rebecca's question around under what conditions would you not recommend um, using nudging? But also questions like Marcus's in the fact that in Australia, we seem to be a lot more comfortable with kind of mandating for public good than in, in many other more individualistic societies. So what's the role of nudging in, in places like Australia? And what are the limits of nudging in general? So, you know, I think we, we just went through kind of what the limits are for the two big problems on our agenda right now. And we don't think nudging is the answer to every problem. And you're right that many of these decisions are political. So in Australia, retirement saving is mandatory. In the UK, they created a system similar to yours, but did not make it mandatory. They just nudged via automatic enrollment. Now, enrollment is over 90%. So you can have a le legitimate discussion as to which system is better. The UK system gives more freedom. 
uh, the Australian system gets everybody enrolled, which is better. That's up to you. And that's the sort of thing. That's why we have elections. On changing minds, Theresa is asking, how do you nudge a behavior when, when it's actually the mindset that needs to be changed and not the behavior? You know, this is when, when Cass and I appear jointly, this is the sort of question I would say, Cass, you know. <laughs> so. Um, I'll use that to call him, by the way, but yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I think, look, we, we like to say we didn't invent nudging. There was nudging in the Garden of Eden. I'm not saying who nudged who, you know, but there was apples and serpents and, you know, stuff happened uh, like Cain and Abel. So, uh, Nudging down under. you know, so um, we didn't invent that and we didn't invent persuasion and evil nudging existed before we wrote the book. Bernie Madoff didn't need to read our book. So there are tools of persuasion and, you know, I'm not an expert in rhetoric, but I, I think we can try to persuade people, but it doesn't always work as we're seeing with the vaccine holdouts. And part of it is people have to believe the source of where the information is coming from. And the, the people who think that a vaccine is gonna make them sick are not very good at looking at data and are getting their information from pretty unreliable sources. And I wish I had an answer to that. Um, that's another question that you might have an, an, an answer to. Um has to do with, with social media and technology has been, has been popping up quite a bit since, since, last, since you last wrote Nudge. Um, you know, we've had Facebook, Twitter, um, all the social media coming online. And Lauren's asking about um, adg algorithms um, uh, that are designed to, to nudge and the power of, of such nudging. So maybe, maybe just adding to that, if we think of, let's say, algorithmic nudging as, as a phenomenon, do we need to talk about a new phenomenon where the algorithm um, works out the nudging according to an internal logic where it's a black box? We know what, the, we know what it's nudging for, but we don't know what it's using to, to nudge us that, that way. Well, yeah, so let, let me say that uh, I think algorithmic nudging has gotten a bad rap. And lots of algorithms work really well for the consumer. If Netflix recommends a movie, it's based on an algorithm. They have no interest in getting you to watch a movie you're going to hate. Spotify has a feature called Discover Weekly. I love Discover Weekly. Discover Weekly is a playlist that each one is different. And uh, I think it's brilliant. And it's a mixture. It, it, one thing it isn't, it's not like a playlist of your favorite music. It, that's why it's called Discover. This is their guess as to music you might like. And it typically, as the playlist goes on, gets more and more adventuresome. But uh, I don't want to listen to the same music all the time. I'd like to be introduced to new things. Now, in a completely different direction, algorithms can improve decision making in all kinds of settings maybe especially physicians. So algorithms are better than physicians at reading x-rays. They're often better at making diagnoses. They can uh, reduce prescriptions for opioids. So sure, there can be algorithms that are designed to fish and take your money away 
but um, I, it, if you asked me, would I rather have a world with or without algorithms? That's a no-brainer for me. I like algorithms. Uh, we're coming. We're coming close to the end. So maybe very quickly, something that's been in the in the news um, over the last couple of days. You've probably seen um, the um, crisis of replication seems to be coming to um, to behavioral economics. Uh, there's um, Dan, one of Dan Ariely's landmark studies on on uh, cheating seems to seems to be up for retraction. Is the crisis of replication from social psychology coming to to behavioral economics? So I, I think largely the answer to that is no. And uh, if you think about that study, it's really an example of, of priming. The, the, the idea was if you get people to sign something at the beginning rather than the end, then that's going to get people to be more honest. And... Uh, I can tell you, we tried this at the UK nudge unit, it didn't work. So I have suspected for a long time that that particular thing didn't work. There was one, one study in the original nudge that we had to take out because of the replication crisis. And uh, that's the work of Brian Wansink, uh, who had some studies that I think were true but he clearly had some others that he made up the data and that's not good. But, you know, the first book I wrote uh, was called The Winner's Curse and it's a collection of economics anomalies. And I'm going to do something similar with that because there were six more that I wrote that didn't get included in that book and we're, we're going to issue a new new one, and I'm working on it with Alex Imus, who's a young behavioral economist. But our initial look at the data is there's not a single one of those, and there are about 20. There's not a single one where we would want to change a word. So the ultimatum game, loss aversion, overconfidence, uh, every one of those I replicate at the beginning of every class I teach. So, uh, I, you know, I'm not trying, not, you know, I'm knocking on my wood desk and I'm not saying that no behavioral economic study will ever fail to replicate, but the foundations that were created by my mentors, Kahneman and Tversky, those are big effects. And when you go 70, 30, 30, 70, uh, that's not going to go away. And loss aversion doesn't go away. Overconfidence doesn't go away. Uh, so let, let, me, let, me, let me just uh, uh, go back and say, looking forward to launching that book when it's come out, <laughs> uh, hoping in person with a with a good bottle of wine. Um, but just for following up on that, one of the most popular questions from John was that was about whether you whether this, if anything, you've changed your mind about over the last 18 months in relation to um, nudge or behavioral economics in, in general as a result of COVID, or more broadly, since you've last written your, your nudge book. Well, I don't I don't know that we changed our mind about anything very important. Um, I don't think we took anything back except we took this one study out that it wasn't a study that failed to replicate, by the way. It was a study that must be true. It's this study that if they had the tomato soup that was being refilled secretly from the bottom and people were eating huge quantities of soup. I mean, that that must be right. But, uh, but no, I don't, I mean, I think everything in that book is, is put, put pretty modestly. And we don't make bold claims about what we can do. And uh, things like automatic enrollment, save more tomorrow, are being adopted all around the world. 
uh, I'm not taking anything back. Well, on, on, on that note, <laughs> we're very getting very, very close to uh, the end of our time with you. I just do want to remind people that if, if you're interested in if you're interested in, in humans and, and living better in the world, you can um, order um, Richard and, and Cass's new book, Nudge, the final edition. You can order it online. And if you've enjoyed our discussion about changing the way we think about the world, uh, you can also subscribe to our new podcast series, The Unlearn Project, about changing common sense. You know, why robots are coming to make your job harder or what music is for while small is the new big and while there's no such thing as the internet. Um, and you can subscribe to The Unlearn Project wherever you got your podcasts. And Richard, as the father of behavioral economics, um, you gave us one of our biggest unlearns, humans, not econs. And so, so, so much more today. Um, thank you so much, Richard. But to wrap it up, I will hand it back over to Dan. Thank you once again for coming. One of the things that I want to thank you for that people may not know about, and this is actually uh, mostly Richard's idea than mine. He's a, a, people may not know this and he may not want people to know this, but he's quite a sweetheart. And last year he came to my class and uh, uh, obviously by distance awarded the first Kahneman Thaler prize, which is on nudging for good and is now available not to people in my class, but to everyone at the university. The deadline's October 23rd, and you can find information on the Strategy Entrepreneurship and Innovation website. So thank you for this. I have one question, uh, or one or two quick questions. What One is, um, you know, how much, well, how much sludging, when we look at universities in the States and how much people get... Uh, paid that aren't either doing teaching or uh, uh, or research and uh, the extravagant fees they're getting charged in the states and when we look at companies and uh, the bloat say in hospital care uh, you have any spitball amounts on how much might be saved by having a chief sludge officer no uh, no I don't <laughs> uh, a lot, but uh, it, uh, it, that that chief sludge officer would be very unpopular. Uh, but uh, you know, and in, in some ways, the problem is that you know, uh, as you, as you know, I. Uh, I'm involved in a money management firm called Fuller and Taylor. And we have somebody that's called a compliance officer. And every asset manager has a compliance officer and compliance officers are always hated. Now ours is not, she's lovely, uh, but that's not the only job she does. But generally speaking, the rule keeper, you know, the pe people hate the ref and, uh, so that, that's easier said than done, but I do think every organization, particularly large organizations, should go through a sludge mediation <laughs> activity. And I think they could save a lot of money and buy a lot of nice bottles of wine. That's right. And then the last one, comes back to an earlier book of yours, and I always like to bring it up when we talk. Um, in Misbehaving, I believe it is, you talk about, uh, I told you Danny's uh, uh, nicest compliment to me, and to round out the day, I wanna uh, share a compliment Danny said about you that you've heard many times, but he calls you lazy, and I thought how we might square that circle with a Nobel Prize winner being called lazy as a compliment. And, and well, day. you know, the problem with not, not only does Danny, who is my best friend and has been for 30 odd years, not only does he call it 
call me lazy. He insists it's my best quality. And if your best friend is saying that about you, I would say you're in a heap of trouble. Now, he contends that this is a compliment because it means I'm only willing to work on things that are important. I think what's more true is I'm only willing to work on things that I find interesting and occasionally other people find them interesting too. Thank you so much, Richard. I, I appreciate it. And uh, Sandra, did you have a good, goodbye to say or we're done here? Oh, just thank you, Dan. And thanks, Mark. And thanks to the hundreds of people who have tuned oh, in thank for you, this. Sandra, for putting um, this together. And, and Mark, I uh, appreciate it very much. Thank and you, Richard, actually, so much. Bye, everybody down under and uh, stay safe. Okay. Thank stay you. safe.